I lived in Isom Hall. <laughs> I hate to tell you how many years ago I lived in Isom Hall. It'll be 40 years. Next year I will have graduated from Ole Miss 40 years ago. That, that's true. The year I lived in Isom Hall, one of the major things that I remember about it, aside from the fact that it was an old dormitory and therefore sophomores lived in it instead of in Bonnard or Somerville, which were the new dormitories, was that across the hall from me there lived a young woman who got up at 5.30 every morning to meet her 8 o'clock class because it took her an hour to comb her hair. Um, and that was very important, combing your hair. Uh, I went to Ole Miss from 1939 to 1942 after a year at Randolph-Macon Women's College in Lynchburg, Virginia. There was a major change in the female mores at Ole Miss the year I arrived, 1939, and those of you, of you who are old enough to remember it may remember what the cause of it was. We got a new student union building, which is now the uh, computer center, I believe. Uh, prior to that time, the Greeks had been more or less a kind of student union building. The Greeks was a little building that wasn't much bigger than this room, I don't think, and it had an upstairs and a downstairs. Downstairs, you went to get coffee and donuts and, and to meet your dates. Upstairs was the post office. It was very important to have a date. You couldn't go to the post office unless you had a date. <laughs> Literally, literally, if you were a sorority girl, you did not go to the post office unless you had a date. It was a disgrace. Horrors. Your sisters would have been very unhappy with you. So if you didn't have a date at 10 o'clock, which was the time that the mail was put up, then you asked your roommate or one of your sorority sisters to pick up your mail for you when they went to the Greeks. Uh, well, with the building of the new uh, center, student union building, Things changed. I never suffered through that period. My older sister told me about it. Because at the union building, there were a number of very complex activities going on. The Mississippian had its offices there. The Ole Miss had its offices there. There were meeting rooms, and there was a grill, and there was a post office. Clearly, if you were on the Mississippian staff or the Ole Miss staff, you had to go to the union whether you had a date or not. <laughs> so girls got to pick up their mail. You didn't have to worry about who was going to bring you daddy's check that month. It's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable that you never went anywhere at Ole Miss without a date at that time. Even then, after the building of the, of the Union, datelessness in the grill was not permissible. You could go to the post office or you could go to upstairs to a meeting. Parenthetically, I might add, as Dr. Street has pointed out, that there were a great many men at Ole Miss, three to one in my time, and therefore there were a great many men to have dates with, so that uh, m most people had a number of dates. <laughs> if you had a date at 10, I'm not kidding you, you had a date at 10 for the mid-morning break, you had a date for lunch. You had a date after your 2 o'clock class for the picture show or to go to, uh, to the swimming pool. You had a date for supper at the cafeteria. And you had a date at night to go down to Jim's Cafe and drink beer, uh, which, of course, was not permissible, but it was what everybody did. <laughs> if there was a meeting, you usually had a date for the meeting, unless it was a panel and a council. There were two dances and sometimes three every weekend every weekend also a tea dance you had to worry about dates not only for the dances but for the no breaks and the specials <laughs> there were four no breaks and two specials you had to have a date for all of those oh it was hard, hard. <laughs> this was also the era of the 45 degree angle those of you who are women my age or older and familiar with old times at Ole Miss, will remember Miss Hepley, the Dean of Women, and the 45 degree angle. The 45 degree angle rule specified that if you were seated on the ground on the campus, you could not recline at more than a 45 degree angle. <laughs> if 
you did, you got campus. You got campus for the weekend. So one way to avoid admitting you didn't have a date for a dance would be to recline at the 45 degree angle and then you couldn't go to the dance. So it was okay, you see. Um, for female students, there were no overnight absences from the campus without written invitation from a hostess, written permission from parents, and written evidence of the presence of a chaperone, female. My future mother-in-law made herself very popular during the years I was at Ole Miss by writing notes for anybody who wanted to go anywhere, <laughs> saying that she was chaperoning them. <laughs> that was the world we lived in. We were, if we were reasonably popular, we had a good time in it. We vote, devoted very little thought to those who lived outside the system. At first glance, it might seem to be an innocent, if frivolous, world, but it was not. For upper middle class girls, Ole Miss was the state marriage market. We were there whether we admitted it to ourselves, whether we knew it consciously or not, to get an upper middle class husband. We were joining the tribe, and any anthropologist can tell you that the ceremonies attendant on joining the tribe are serious. The rights of sorority membership, the requirements of dating, the strictures of chaperonage, the 45 degree angle, all had directly to do with delivering us unsullied to a prosperous and successful husband inside the system. But by the time I got to Ole Miss, I had devoted some painful hours to thinking about what it was like outside the system. I had spent my first year at Randolph-Macon Women's College. I had gone there at 16 an innocent young woman from a family whose mother had not gone to college and who didn't know a sorority from a hole in the ground. I was in love. I was an intellectual. I was a dead loss as far as sororities were concerned. Perhaps the message didn't even get through to me that I was supposed to join the system. And besides that, I was different in very unsubtle ways. Looking back, I remember that my mind was not on clothes, and if it had not had been, I had not really acquired an eye for them. I never learned how to apply makeup skillfully. I still can't. And although I felt very sexy, I don't think I looked very sexy. <laughs> In fact, I was probably tacky. And so, during rush at, old, at Randolph Macon, when the third party took place, my name was not on the list. Never mind that after a call from the chapter at Ole Miss, where my sister was still a sister, my own sister was still a sister, it got back on. Never mind that everyone assured me it was a terrible mistake. I decided not to join. It was a drab year. No one cared if I met a man from West WNL or Virginia or North Carolina. No one cared whether I got to a dance or a game. Of the young women left behind with me in the dormitory on the weekends, almost none had stayed outside the system deliberately. They were the girls whose parents had been unable to afford braces for their teeth, or the girls who were painfully shy, or painfully aggressive, or painfully fat, or homely. My most vivid memory of that year, aside from the memory of looking out my third story dormitory window and wondering when I'd get up the nerve to jump, was the memory of the sound echoing through the halls of a song that was at the top of the hit parade for weeks and months that year. Old man Mose is dead. Mose kicked the bucket, the singer shouted over and over again. Buck, buck, bucket? I was so innocent I didn't know for weeks why they kept playing it over and giggling at that line. All I knew was that I felt as dead as old man Mose. So the following year, I went to Ole Miss and like thousands before and after me, I joined the dance. It was the practical act of one who intended to survive and if possible to triumph. I mastered the rules. I functioned efficiently and joyfully. So efficiently, in fact, that I ended up as president of Chi Omega. 
and I often had as many as four or five dates every day. I did indeed meet the man I eventually married. I never missed a dance or a football game. All my no breaks were filled. But what else was going on at Ole Miss around, above, below the function of the marriage market? It was, after all, a university. Not simply the sacred ground designated by the tribe for initiation rites of sorority and fraternity, ballroom and football field, preparation for marriage and for life. Was there time between dates to attend classes? After dancing all Friday and Saturday nights to the music of Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and Benny Goodman, yes, we had all the big bands, not to mention Miller Holmes's Mississippians, which were just as good, we thought. Could we even get our weary, swollen feet into our dirty saddle Oxfords to make the trek up the hill from Isom to Bondurant? We did, in fact, at that time, have an outstanding faculty in the College of Liberal Arts. Jim Silver and Bell Wiley and Dr. Matthews were in the history department. Pete Kyle McCarter and Adwin Wigfall Green and Dudley Hutchinson were in the English department, for example. Paul Foreman and Dr. King in the sociology department. All these men, then in early middle age, went on to distinguished academic careers. We could learn if we cared to, if we had the time and the inclination. But my recollection is not that we, women, were much encouraged either by our sisters or by the atmosphere in which we lived. The young men, yes, they were going on in many cases to professional school and learning was a serious business for them. We were supplied with all the dates our hearts could desire even if only a third of them made themselves available on any given day. I did well in my work. I came from a conscientious Presbyterian family and I was required to do well. I took Dr. Hutchison's class in creative writing and my stories pleased him. I won the Taylor Medal in sociology, but my mind was on having a good time and I knew beyond question that that was what it was supposed to be on. Somehow, the passion for art, the commitment to the language, to the craft of writing, that later were to be a central part of my life, had almost no part in my life at Ole Miss. Here there was another, an equally serious, an equally deadly game to be played, and I played it example of the difference between the point of view toward male and female students during my time was the Scribblers Club. I was a scribbler. I wrote stories. I made A pluses in creative writing as did half a dozen other students in the English department. And there was a club for people who were interested in writing. Half a dozen professors, half a dozen students were honored each year to join the professors. The professors chose the students. Could blackball anybody they liked. There were no women, no women in the scribblers. I didn't even think about it at the time. It never crossed my mind that I should be in the scribblers. It would have made me very peculiar. Yeah. Would have, it would have killed a number of dates, I dare say. <laughs> Some years later, oh, 20, 30 years later, I, I said to my husband, just passed through my mind, and he had been a member of Scribblers and was managing editor of the Mississippian and was interested in writing. I said, I wonder why there weren't any women in Scribblers. It had obviously never crossed his mind either. He said, well, we usually met at the fraternity houses. <laughs> very good reason, very good reason. <laughs> of the men who were in Scribblers, professional teachers, academics, and students during the three years that I was at Ole Miss, I am the only one who ever became a professional writer at the national level. <laughs> True. And now, how have things changed at Ole Miss in 40 years? 
surely three wars, a revolution in sexual mores, the feminist movement, a racial revolution, have made all these things that I've said about the past irrelevant. But that's not the case. True, the marriage market in statistical terms and in realistic terms is perhaps not so important as it once was. 50% of all the marriages contracted by these young people will end in divorce. True, there are every year a larger percentage of women in the workforce. There's a greater need for serious professionalism among women. But last week at the Hoka, or week before last, I saw a movie called Rush, and it did not seem to me that the point of view of the young women in sororities now is much different from the point of view then. So oblivious to the flaws in the system were most of these young women and most of the young women who were watching the movie, that I don't think that they saw that it made a devastating, satirical comment on the system. The tribal rights are still acted out in the sorority houses. In my day, we didn't have chorus lines. We didn't have identical outfits. We didn't do blackface skits. We just had white gloves and spectator pumps and hats. Everybody wore hats. But there were the same, there are the same sad faces in that movie of girls who don't get bibs, the same obliviousness on the part of those who do, the same vows of eternal sisterhood on the basis of a few chaotic afternoons of milling around together. And I saw, too, on some of those faces, the ironic smiles, the stamp of reservation that says, we see clearly it's all foolishness. It's all foolishness. The evidence of detachment that discloses among these women intelligence and objectivity. Of course, we all know that in one form or another, snobbery, the stamp of inness, is going to exist. If it's eliminated in one way, it will come back in another. I think it's probably true that in a great many universities in the 60s and 70s, outness was inness. One was in only if one didn't join. But those of us who were in college during the 60s and 70s needn't, con so those of us who were in college during the 60s and 70s needn't congratulate ourselves too complacently if we didn't join. And I know that this center as a reality will be a bulwark against the kind of inness and snobbery that I'm talking about. It's deeply important in a university for its students to feel that a strong network of support, the possibility of another kind of social life, exists for those who do not care to be or who are not included in the tribal rights of sorority and fraternity. We need to give these students a sense of the richness and variety of the alternatives to the empty, exclusive social world. All of us, parents, faculty, and administration, have some complicity in any failure to provide for young women a vital world of comradeship in professionalism, a sense of the great variety of futures that may open out to them that have nothing whatever to do with this narrow, rigidly structured social scheme and the drastically limited life that will follow of mistress, mother, parent, and nothing else. The opening of ISOM Center for Women is a step in this direction, and it is one to which we must all give our heartfelt support. I was talking to a woman in, in Greenville last week, a friend of mine who's in her middle 40s. She has four children. She's having a little trouble with her husband, trying to find a way to move outside the life of her family without breaking up her marriage. And she said, I want to do something. I don't want to go through my life never having done anything but feel. And that's the life of a woman who doesn't move outside the limiting world of emotional attachment to family, 
to husband, to children. To know, to do, to make is as important to a woman as it is to a man. And that's what we must give our students here. Thank you.